Good evening. Thank you, everyone. Before um, we begin, if you could all just please turn your phones on silent or off entirely for novelty would be great. Um, it's a pleasure to launch this term's um, evening lecture series with a guest who the school knows very, very well and whose work many of you will be familiar with. Francesca Hughes taught at the AA from 2003 to 2011 as unit master in the diploma school with the legendary Diploma 15. And for many years, the work of Diploma 15 was known really especially for two things. Um, their interest in hyper-contexts, or what Francesca called those contexts that the architect creates as cultural, temporal, or spatial parameters that sit between the actual, between the geographic, location of the project, and the architect herself. So that's the first aspect. And the second, uh, really importantly, is the unit's big drawings. And um, they were incredible, really large format maps, diagrams, and strange information-based drawings created by the students in the unit um, for the purposes especially of inventing and describing their own projects and their own hypercontexts. Her own obsessions with post-digital context along the great, alongside the great question of where and how to situate architecture within it has led to a really fascinating oscillation between an almost steampunk-like redrawing of historical technologies with then the wildly optimistic imaginings of future industrial and high-tech architectures. And so I mention this because even in 2013, the work um, by Francesca was already well underway um, on research and writing that led to the material Francesca will be presenting this evening in a talk titled The Architecture of Error, and most importantly also part of the book on sale in the South Jury Room, so please go visit after the talk. Um, it's the title of the Libs publication, recently published by MIT Press. The book provides a deep history, you might say, of architects' long, long time intolerance with imprecision, with the rise of material testing and other forms of supposedly increasingly error-free ways of thinking um, and working and describing architectural work, most especially since the mid-20th century and the rise of cybernetics, computers, and other modern design platforms. Francesca Hughes lives and works in London, where she taught for many years at the Bartlett and here at the AA. She's the author and editor of many publications and a frequent international lectures, lecturer. Her publications also include The Architect, Restructuring Her Practice, published in 1996, a groundbreaking collection of writings by a dozen leading scholars on gender and architecture, as well as drawings that count um, publication on 60 drawings um, of Diploma 15 alongside some brilliant essays included in the book. Her writings have been published in AA Files, AR, ENI, Art Forum, and others. She's also a founding partner with Jonathan Meyer of the Hughes Meyer Studio in London. And please join me in welcoming back to the AA, Francesca Hughes. Thank you very much, Natasha. Um, it's very lovely to be back here. Um, it's very lovely to be back here with this book because in many ways, I'm actually going to have to get rid of this book because I don't remember it. Um, in many ways, this book was made in the AA. It was always going on in the back of my head when I was teaching in the unit. I always kept it separate from the unit work because I somehow had to and I still don't really know why that is. Um, but it was really test-driven on the students here several times at the invitation of Mark Cousins in the History and Theory series, and kind of three times, actually. First time in its kind of primordial slime state of development, which was very much tolerated by the students, and then again getting perhaps to kind of woolly mammoth stage, and then again getting a bit more developed later on. And I, I think that the... Um, students rarely know how much they actually drive their teacher's work. And this was really driven and sharpened by the kind of, you know, bemused interrogation of the students here in the history and theory seminars that it was part of. So thank you. Um, I want to start with Hook's needle. So I want to start with Hook taking up what he regarded to be his most precise instrument, the most precise thing he had around him. Whence we say sharpest, he writes, we say as sharp as a needle. And putting the tip of the needle on his compass, that one would swing to draw space, 
under the millionfold magnification of his microscope in 1665. What he finds is not a smooth, sharp point, but to his horror, a kind of rugged, lumpen, misfigured, and by the very rudeness and bungling of art, that's the very rudeness and bungling of fabrication. Pulling away from his microscope and regarding the instrument with which he, Newton, and Wren would soon rebuild London, he commented that, quote, how much therefore can be built upon demonstrations made only by the production of the ruler and compass? He will be better able to consider that shall but view those points and lines with the microscope. He then turns from the needle to what he hopes is the safety of the printed point, the full stop, the kind of, in a sense, the precursor of the pixel, and finds these no less bungled and ends up calling them smutty daubings, which I kind of rather love as a name. And indeed, he warns <coughs> Prince, uh, not Prince Charles, King Charles II, who, to whom micrographia is addressed, that um, kind of sense, rest assured, there's plenty more out there that look way more ugly than this one, and he actually, that, that were too scary to draw. This is the one that was reasonably okay to draw. So one can only assume that the other full stops must have been even hairier. Finally, the swinging road and the suspension cables give way and plunge into the water below. Fortunately, the only casualties were a car stalled on the bridge and a dog. So this is, um, one can describe this as a film in which one, one animal was harmed in the making of this film, not none. Um, this is to say, in a way, this is not the error I'm talking about. Um, this is, I'm not, this book or the work in this book um, attends to not the kind of epic error of catastrophic collapse, the seminal images of Tacoma Bridge here, nor does it attend to the kind of chronic failure of modernism and the kind of ambivalent legacy of its ur urbanism, nor does it really attend to the kind of errance of syntax that's so central to Eisenman's work on Romeo and Juliet, nor does it regard the kind of erroneous forms of the monstrous that, and their relation to the ugly, though, of course, as we saw with the full stop, that's always kind of there, latent in the wings. Nor does it attend to the kind of aesthetic errori of the artist that strays from the true path um, against which Michelangelo championed Vasari. Nor to the ethical errors delineated by morality. Those we shall see, these are never far behind physical error. What this book addresses, though, is the micro and minor error that plays, plagues all material, materialization, the kind of most insignificant error. And this is not to say that indeed such error is insignificant. The humble, almost negligible error, not unlike its ethical counterpart, always starts small, but as any theologian would argue, has a kind of infinite capacity to expand, to occupy a kind of increasing, increasing space as it grows in its effect as perhaps the Tacoma Bridge film demonstrates. And it's against this symbolic threat that the digital dimensioning to several places, like the sharpened pencil points before it, stand ranked. Hook's scope, like Alberti's window, was installed in the computer. Place another one in there. So like the picture within a picture within a picture idea. Right, it's real nightmare material. And it's going to get smaller, back. even though the spot sort of disappears, uh, it's really still there. So this is Sutherland's 1962 sketch pad program, um, there being kind of, in a sense, demonstrated for the first time at MIT. And Sketchpad, as you may know, is widely recognized now as the progenitor at CAD. And as he says, um, as you zoom out, it's very much the kind of same experience as Hook pulling away from the microscope. The spot is still there. This is again Sketchpad. On the side, we regard this as a window that we can move over our paper and, and enlarge the size of this window. We can uh, imagine the computer as a fixed sheet of paper behind this window. Its scale is approximately two miles on the side. Two miles? Two miles. The window, with the piece of paper that is, the design plane behind the window is now about 14 million miles wide. Um, that potentially is, I think it possibly is, the first naming of the window, the computer interface as being the window. 
The vertiginous void Hook felt himself falling through as he peered through his microscope and the accuracy gap he saw opening up between its magnification and the naked eye is not dissimilar to that which now opens up between the electronic drawing in which every 3D point is typically defined to six or more decimal places. On the one hand, sorry, the, the kind of the point being defined as six or more decimal places on the one hand, and on the other hand, the setting out on site, in the mud, in the rain, by gloved hands belonging to different bodies. So the wall once drawn to precisely a judged approximation is now drawn at a default 10 to the minus six, and is thus becoming a kind of methodological absurdity. When Gordon Matter Clark took a chainsaw to a white suburban house in splitting, which was also the previous image, to cut a section. He was, amongst other things, already making a mockery, himself an architect, of the architect's then immaculate drafting film and 0.18 pen. Gordon Matter Clark is very good at taking us back to that kind of dangerous middle ground when form and matter are still in negotiation and error runs rife. And, um, one can learn a lot about Meta Clark's on building projects, actually through looking at the films of the processes. And what one finds is that he works with zero margin for error. There is zero redundant precision in the way that he works. And this is partly possible because he is the drawing. His body is the drawing. All the fabrication instruction is in his body. And thus, he's able to improvise and to do things that architects are not meant to do, which hopefully we're about to see him doing. So he's cut the house in two, and then what he's doing now is knocking out the top course of cinder blocks and the foundation walls at one end so that the house can tip open. and he has to catch the house, as the house tips beyond expectation. <coughs> the Baroque invisible architecture of margins for error that once traced its way through the paper drawing is rendered all the more complex in the digital drawing and now in digital fabrication. Here, tolerance is assigned, or more often left as a very default setting at the various interfaces of the software used, a ladder of bottlenecks, the tightest of which, in a sense, decides what gets through. But now that we have the ability to calculate perfection using no more or less gas than approximation, which in a sense is actually not true, approximation in digital terms is more work, but let's just keep that aside, pretend we don't know that for a moment. Surely it's time to ask, what does this mean? What exactly does it mean to, or what is exactly does it do to the relations between the calculated or the drawn, the materially fabricated, sorry, the calculated or drawn on the one hand, and the materially fabricated conventionally or digitally on the other. Is this something that we want? But we don't. The fetishization of precision in architectural culture, whilst testifying to a set of relations that is anything but transparent, also silences any critical interrogation of their inbuilt redundancy. another reason to look at error and we find it in Aristotle and in his conflation of matter with error. This is Cohen Brothers at their best um, using the wood chipper which is in a sense Aristotle's matter conversion mach machine to convert the form of the leg back into matter to dilute the identity of this kind of poor chap who is going into the woodcutter. So on the one hand, that's going on, and on the other hand, we have in the pregnant cop, Marge, who the guy pushing the leg into the wood chipper doesn't know is pregnant, busy doing the opposite, converting matter into form. Aristotle assigns error as a property solely of matter, not of form, and thus, in a sense, error as an agent of matter provides 
a way in, perhaps our only way in, outside of formal questions, that is, to the, sorry, the thus error provides a way into that kind of closed category of matter. Um, out, and that is outside of the kind of relations of fetishization or the traps of fetishization that so much the 20th century fell for. But it also means that physical error embodies everything Aristotelian matter stands for, a complex intersection of indeterminacy, difference, literally gender and race, but not species difference. That's the sole reserve of form, and Aristotle's very particular about that. Um, existence, the role of matter is to lend existence, interiority, and all the, conceal, all the kind of suspicion of concealment that that may carry, which obviously Marge is busy doing under her coat. Process, product is solely reserved for form, and entropy. When things go wrong, it's because of matter. It follows then that any elaboration of error as a category is necessarily a critique of the interest precision is in service to. That is, the question of error, that is, the question of error is always unavoidably political. Aristotle's schema installs the questions we still do not ask. Can something be too precise, for example? The properties we still fear and the degenerate other that we still, whilst keeping it carefully hidden, conversely use to define what we are and what we do. So instituted in architectural practice behind the complex methodological fortifications that protect us against material error, such as margins for error, tolerance, material failure thresholds, standards and specifications, lie the more systemic defenses, the metaphoricity, the ideological colonization of the vacuums technical indeterminacy leaves but never declares, and of course the many epistemic models we deploy. Both methodological and systemic defenses employ extensive use of approximation and extensive use of the sloppy science of inference. There is more scientificity to architecture than we know, yet perhaps not the face of science, the architect that his scientist Monquet aspires to. Collectively, then, these defenses ensure that almost any error that gets through is effectively neutralized. Suffice to say that architectural culture maintains a uniquely convoluted and deluded relations to precision. Indeed, the whole economy that governs the relations between precision use versus error mitigated is now false. And I mean economy in the kind of sense that Lorraine Daston sets up in her um, seminal essay, The Moral Economy, as a system that is regulated, that is balanced, that kind of requires a degree of agreement around exchange. This is when artists, that, that just as when artists talk about their work, we learn not so much about how they work, but about the delusions under which they work. When as architects, we talk about how precise a drawing is, how precise the detail is or a material system is, something we do frequently in practice and even more so in education, we betray like Foucault's unwitting subject, our delusion that quote, words still kept their meaning, that desires still pointed in a single direction, and that ideas, ideas retain their logic. But the logic that we assume organizes the relations between precision and its control of material error in architectural culture and production has long since unraveled. Precision no longer does what it says on the tin. Its desires are now on an altogether different course from their stated purpose. And as for meaning, far from precise in its usage, precision is amongst the most promiscuous of words. For one, Hooke's 18th century precision as an exactitude had to double up in the 19th century to become precision as predictability and uniformity, which could be quite separate from the question of exactitude. And that was obviously needed for the kind of building of empires, and then the 20th century became needed for the mass production. Um, like Hook, if we zoom in on our current generation of scopes, we find that things did not join up, do not join up quite as smoothly as we thought they did. In the last hundred years, odd years, a no man's land has opened up between precision and material error, in which, in which not only is the meaning of these terms far from stable, but the relations that govern our tolerance of material behavior have reached a point of acute crisis. So with this book, what I'm tending to do is to kind of navigate my way through um, this shifting landscape. And in doing so, map the unraveling of a logic on which once so much, once so much once hung. 
Indeed, the rise of precision and by implication its presumed control of error like a ghost shadows the dominant narratives that stitch the removal of ornament from one end of the century to digital fabrication via network at the other. What these narratives don't tell us is that precision and error relations were fundamentally transformed through each of mon modernism's seminal crises. We find precision then to be yet another unspoken obsession of modernism. One begins to wonder how many are there out there subject to fetishization and inflation, and preserved by multiple institutional practices. Indeed, architectural culture's very special fear that it reserves for error constitutes a powerful undertow in all its relations to the processes of materialization. That is, the brick wall drawn to several decimal places is an extraordinary method methodological absurdity that nonetheless strangely doesn't embarrass us at all. On the contrary, we kind of exult in its exactitude. Nor can this simply be explained by digitalization. Here's someone who exalted in exactitude, Conrad Washman, and actually that was him a couple of slides before with his incredible US air frame, air hanger um, proposal. Um, and both Washman's drawings and his photographs of nested components are extraordinary precursors of so much the imagery that's come out of parametricization, the kind of Repet repetitive, undulating surface of kind of um, repetitive units that I must admit at a certain point I thought, well, that must be something about the recursivity of the internal workings of the computers kind of strangely coming to the surface and making it themselves physically manifest. But clearly not. Rochman was doing this long before um, computers had even begun to approach architecture. Rochman, while pursuing the precision beyond the limits of constructability, also claim to be stripping architecture of all redundancy. Clearly, redundant precision did not count. How then are we to understand the function of redundant precision in architecture? It's there to do exactly what? And how much of it is about something else altogether, some kind of undeclared imperative that's not only driving the fetishization of the apparently precise in architectural culture, but also the reverse engineering and the construction of tolerance and materiality that's so central to architectural practice. What I neglected to say, a um, slightly important point, is that Rushman designed joints in which so many members met with so little tolerance that they were literally unbuildable, unconstructable, and he designed them to be constructed. They weren't theoretical projects such as that image. What if we were to add to the familiar litany of historiographic formulae that govern our relations to what we call modernism? So materials got more honest, ornament was removed, solid became ephemeral, clothes planned open, walls got whiter, we can add, linearity delivered the uniformity of mass production. We might even then add construction was eclipsed by automation as a concept gave way to regulatory network. What if we were to add, or in a sense, to substitute all of those with things just got more and more precise? So exponentially precise, in fact, that in its surplus existence, precision in architectural culture broke away from error mitigation, from truthfulness even, and became something else altogether. And with this, so too did error. Did error. Otherwise put, what if we were to consider the key cultural and technological crises that architecture underwent in the last hundred years as driven by a kind of moments of intensification in its deep fear of error? We find that the rejection of organic materials didn't just produce the steel and glass experiments we know so well, but a whole generation of aircraft too heavy to take off because they were metal that the invention of standards and specifications scrambled together in order to control the liquid behavior of this amazing new miracle material, reinforced concrete, that was fast navigating the formwork across America, also rescripted the relations between material error and laborer error, and then ultimately led to rescripting the relations that would allow the flow of data as the flow of casting paved way for the eclipsing of construction itself and the almost mystical, immaculate instantaneity of the form finding and automated fabrication that the rhetoric of parametricization announces some hundred years later. We might, almost find, we might also find that the removal of ornament didn't just make architecture more honest, but rendered the surface, and indeed now the rendering of the surfaces of architecture, an acute site of prison's intensification. 
Ornament, having always occupied a margin of excess, was, it was replaced with new surface excess, surface precision, which in many ways perhaps is best understood as the ornament of today. One might well ask why, given the enormous computational power that the computer so glibly lays at our feet, we would use it to produce very shiny drawings. To quote Loos on the gilded drawing that have come out in a rash. So saturated is their precision that they positively drip resolution. Now, I chose this drawing from all the other very shiny drawings out there because it was so shiny, it's almost slippery. In fact, it's kind of almost wet. And I think, um, you know, at a certain point, you don't really need to know much about Freud or architecture or shoes to look at this and identify fetishization as being a kind of driving course. But whenever one thinks, you have to admit that it's a kind of weird thing to do in the bringing together of Newtonian optics and the microprocessor or the extraordinary calculatory capacity of the computer. We know that the disciplining actions once held within the mechanics of concept are now rehoused within the rubric of network production. But what then are the fears and anxieties that we have also inadvertently installed in the computer? which is not to argue in any way some kind of Luddite position, but to argue for a kind of critical interrogation of how exactly we've chosen to use the hallucinatory, hallucinatory capacity for precision that the computer is kind of offering us. And by implications, the mechanisms of power that its precision is agent to and that error's ambush always undoes, whichever paradigm is employed. So as we trade causal linearity for more systemized modes of production, the fear of error, like the error itself, to quote that nice chap at MIT with his nightmare material, quote, although we can't see it, it's still there. So as error mutates into the next new thing we don't want, which we can only presume is what's happening now, the next new deviation that outwits architecture's ever augmenting corrective measures, what are the new byproducts of our fear? Well, oh. here we go. Already the people of one city have been told as to their preferred living pattern for the end of the century. A computer produced this plan for a city of the future by processing the individual desires of half a million people for different types of homes, methods of transport, patterns of leisure and of work, together with the expected population growth and the resources available. But the computer could only offer a series of mathematical concepts. It is to the degree that we understand this powerful tool and how best to use it that we can gain the maximum possible benefit. For only men and women can ensure that this city of the future will be a place of beauty and tranquility. I thought you might like to see some 50-year-old optimization. I think it's funny. Um, so, in a sense, it's the um, point being that our architecture's facility for correction is exactly what led to the metal aircraft that couldn't fly, as we will see, and more recently has led to numerous projects that can't be wrong because they're optimized, just as this city, in a sense, couldn't be wrong. Um, so what does precision now become? How are we to understand it outside of its duty to exclude error and now potentially uncoupled from its contract with truthfulness? And given this, what is a newly reconfigured space of error? These questions have already been posed by many, well, not many, but key people in STS and history of science. Um, not least uh, Eric Schatzberg and Amy Slayton, Schatzberg's work on aeroplanes, Amy Slayton's work on concrete, Nancy Cartwright's work in the history of science, and Evelyn Fox Keller in the life sciences. Yet perhaps their, their responses, or even perhaps simply just the questions, have more value for and bearing on architecture than on their native disciplines. Equally, several seminal art practices have, have important bearings on the kind of how we might think about the economy of precision and error. Hepworth's te technical notes, and I mean her technical notes, I don't mean um, 
other aspects about the way she writes or other things that she writes about. But her technical notes on the way she negotiates around physical flaws in stone and other flaws that she sought retreat from by turning to abstraction. Matter Clark, we've already touched upon, and his use of zero margin for error and zero mediating media. Rachel Whiteread's strategic delegation to the liquid automation of casting. And Parekh, not an artist, a writer, obviously, use of the algorithm not to generate, not only to generate through constraint, but also to explore the Baroque redundancy that its precision generates. And Via Selmins, who, like Perex, mimics the digital in her almost automated analog flattening and copying as she indexically doubles the surfaces of the sea, desert, and sky. So in this book, I've attempted to address these questions not head on, but via the kind of testimony of a set of kind of artifactual witnesses, as I've kind of called them for my own devices. And in thinking about them and their hardware histories as the kind of fallout from the material tolerance storms or material intolerance storms that took place in the 20th century. Hook's Needle, Sutherland's window, or Hook's Needle and Sutherland's window, Hepworth's quarry, Galladay's dodo or aircraft, Verne's stream, Jules Verne's stream in Journey to the Center of the Earth. Nope, go back. Um, Matter Clark's jigsaw, Schrodinger's doll's house, which we'll see in Perex Corridor, which we'll see in Wittgenstein's radiator. But perhaps the kind of most poignant of these artifactual witnesses of these transformations is the engineered aircraft, engineered flightlessness of the first generation of metal aircraft, which resulted from aviation engineers' full-scale adoption of architecture as rejection of organic materials. And it's interesting, we always dwell on what we import as architects. It's quite interesting to look at what we, what we export. As a result, during the interwar period, the very successful spruce and linen aircraft was as if overnight rebuilt in metal. It became intolerable rebuilt in durolumin as it became intolerable that flight and wood should meet. So what then was it that drove aeronautical engineers to abandon strong, durable, cheap, light timber for strong, durable, expensive, heavy metal in the first place? What was it about the kind of symbolic conflation of flight and wood that suddenly became so intolerable? This to the point that it was better a few generation of metal aircrafts that could not fly or could not carry, or if they could, they couldn't carry much fuel, let alone passengers, let alone ordnance as the war came, than have it be contaminated by things wooden. And here we have the Beardmore Inflexible, these extraordinary albatross wings not soaring the sky, but kind of pottering around a muddy field in Norfolk. All the more ironic given this. How, one might ask, did this emblem of all that is rational become so illogical, so surreally absurd? Flying, declared Corley McDermott in the Aviation Journal at the time, started as an art. Aviation is now crying out to science, and it was the finger of science that pointed to metal in airplane construction. McDermott's finger is clearly divine. Buildings and bridges were steel, even boats were steel. It was destiny that planes were the next in line to be reborn metallic. For one thing, as McDermott goes on to say, and this will all sound very familiar to architects, we can't trust wood any longer. Wood does not enable a manufacturer to say this is true or that is true. The behavior, on metal on the, or the behavior of metal, on the other hand, is predictable, and thus curiously aligned with transparency, accountability, faithfulness, and ultimately the truth, unlike obscure and potentially deceitful organic materials. So note how predictability delivers precision or truthfulness, whilst unpredictability delivers erroneousness. This potent characterization of materials is, of course, very familiar to architects, because we made it. In not only is wood a deceitful harbor of error, literally in Le Corbusier's famous formulation, in the old wood timber bean, there may be lurking some treacherous knot. Whereas, and Corbusier again, steel girders and more recently reinforced concrete are pure manifestations of calculations. That is, the stress-strain calculations rendered physical, manifestations of almost pure form. But whose form exactly? 
metal better conforms to the approximatory architecture of Hooke's law. As we well know, metal came to stand for the unchallenged triangulation of precision, predictability, and truth, and wood thus came to stand for its anathema. But these aircraft that do not fly ask difficult questions about technological instrumentalism, about how it con conceals indeterminacy latent in any material system, and how it thus provides an opportunity for ideological insertion. Wood does not lie, metal does not tell the truth. Yet these very early planes that couldn't fly were deemed superior to the wooden ones that could because they represented an error-free reality. Great, unless you need to fly. Time and again, the workshop floor failed to confirm the arguments of metal's proponents. As rhetoric and material would not match, the result of buckling calculations and tests, the strongest argument for wood over ply, wood and ply over metal, was suppressed. The manufacturing, the fund, government funding of wood glue man, uh, manufacturing was stopped. Stiffening features were quietly added to the metal airplanes, such as corrugations, rendering the aircraft slower to make, even more expensive, and even heavier. For the aviation, what's important to understand is that for the aviation engineers accustomed to working with wood and to kind of pushing back to even slimmer margins of error and working almost to kind of breaking point, being suddenly required to pull back and work within the predictable elastic range with metal, metal's kind of comfort zone, as it were, constituted a radical change to their relations to material precision. That is, it was metal that first fattened up the margins in airplanes. It was metal, that embodiment of all that is precise, that first inserted a structural redundancy in the ultimate engineered, rationalized artifact, the aircraft. Metal was pushed through by the interests of the military industrial complex, the metal triangle it was called, but also by responsible men under the spell of metal. Metal had become almost not a material, but calculation itself. Not only that which itself stands for the truth by predictability, but also that which is able to both explain and to be explained. In bypassing the phenomenological and providing direct representation of the theoretical, here Hooke's law. Metal is singularly able to collapse what is meant to be observable and describable, i.e. the material that which, um, with, with that which by definition is not meant to be observable, i.e. the kind of fundamental law that governs the material's behavior. This, you know, metal kind of was able to do all these things that no other material was able to do. It was set up as being able to do all these things that no other material was able to do. It closed the gap between the phenomenological and the theoretical. And it allowed you to see this thing that you weren't meant to be able to see, the fundamental law. Physicists do not observe fundamental laws. Thus, metal was crucially and epistemologically separated from error, because obviously fundamental laws make no error. But recombining description and explanation is not without conflict. Explanatory power often comes at a price Often it's the truth or veracity itself, and Ptolemaic astronomy kind of being a seminal example, inference assumes a causality where there is none. Indeed, Van Frassen suggested that the truth could be considered an optional extra to best explanation. In pursuit of this descriptive explanatory collapse, the price the metal airplane played was flight itself, and as it sacrificed and sacrificed all functional logics in pursuit of predictability. These flightless aircraft plot the undeclared space of technical indeterminacy and instrumentalism that is always already contaminated by culture. Yet how often since Le Corbusier's pedantic lesson that was up a moment ago, has technology's cultural neutrality been deployed in the epistemological accounts of the architect? Part of the privileged epistemology of technology is, as Mulcahy points out, its practical effectiveness exempts it from sociological or other forms of explanation, which is obviously an enviable position to be in if you don't have to explain yourself, which is presumably why architects are so kind of enamored of the technological. What then if a technology has no practical effectiveness? Is it still exempt? And what do such artifacts or such explananda do to the explanatory enterprise of technology's delivery of scientific truthfulness and what do they in turn do to the epistemological duties of the architect, 
or the, epist the kind of, in a sense, the explanatory enterprise of the architects, arch architects being so bent on explanation, as we know. The relations between explanatory truth and truth are inversely proportional. The more complex the phenomena, the more minimal the explanatory model. But it is, by definition, in the nature of error to resist such minimal modeling in the name of precision. The modeling's in the name of precision, not error's resistance. Conversely, the form of explanatory models can be understood as being driven by fear of error. I want now to turn to another kind of case of architecture's export of minimal modeling and architecture's surprising role in the installation of its corrective power in the miniature and ultimately in code. And I want to do this by looking at two very unfashionable architects, the last Victorian architect, Edwin Lutyens, and the first, although he didn't know it and he would have been reluctant if he did, cybernetic architect, Erwin Schrodinger. And for those of you who don't know, Schrodinger's the guy in the bottom right-hand corner who's looking very sober and very uncomfortable in that melee. Both were strangely stranded outside of their time in the first decades of the 20th century. Both engaged in projects of unparalleled colonial ambition, both of which ultimately failed. Both struggling with entropy and its scalar relations to error. Not surprisingly, it is in the explanatory models that surround reproduction, architectural and other, that we find the fear of error and its mechanisms for its control most elaborately and ruthlessly deployed. How living things are copied and the epistemic traffic that ensues is a kind of veritable engine of uh, rhetorical narratives, linguistic tropes and metaphoric diversions. Any elaboration of error in architecture must though inevitably address entropy and the anti-entropic duties of the architect. And nowhere was the role of entropy more scrutinized than the apparently entropy-free business of reproduction. And it was this that brought Schrodinger, physicist Schrodinger, with his ideas about negative entropy to genetics and thus to the microscope. But where Hooke had found the horror of error, Schrodinger found or installed order immune from error of entropy. He also installed the architect. So I will read this. Oh. It is these chromosomes that contain some kind of code script of the entire pattern of the individual's future development and its functioning in the mature state. But the term code script, which becomes crucial, of course, is, of course, too narrow. The chromosome structures are at the same time instrumental in bringing about the developments they foreshadow, that is, the chromosome decides everything about the future. They are law code and executive power. Or to use another simile, they are architect's plan, builder's craft in one. I still find this statement breathtaking. They are law, it's delivery, execution, instruction, process, they're also the future. And he names them architect. Schrodinger's choice of the word architect to describe the centralized authority of the chromosome, linchpin to his gene action theory, betrayed his struggle with the assignment of the precarious transmission of a species blueprint, and a species archive for that matter, via mere matter. An anxiety he correctly identified architects happened to share and had developed certain strategies for managing. Only the architect as metaphoric henchman, as opposed to say a conductor or a sculptor, would brook no ambition from matter. What is life and its hero architect erected the rhetorical software of molecular biology, a megastructure that led by the late 20th century life sciences to the eclipse of life by information and to the cybernetic space of all current architectural reproduction. This architect was the regulations, the standards and specifications, the drawings, the contract, the construction process itself. It was also to become the builded completed in occupation and in demolition, as the breathtaking scope of its rhetorical ambitious ambitions scripted a kind of cradle to grave biography. The gene was thus made the site of an all-encompassing and fundamental animating force. This astonishingly was no idea about how it worked, about what it actually did. Like Cartrame de Cancy's type, that is the, quote, inflexible rule that redresses all depraved customs, all vicious errors that are the inevitable result of blind routine and successive imitation, i.e. copying, 
The gene too is constructed as both law and generative engine, whose exact workings were nonetheless strategically vague. And it's interesting to remember now that in the 1980s in writing on the walls, when Vidlow is explaining the kind of nefariousness of the architectural type of Cratromer's type, he uses the gene to explain the type back to architects. Like all enduring epistemological narratives, gene action excluded all other lines of inquiry before the question could even be asked. What might be the role of the cell matter? Could it not be feeding information back up the causal chain? The gene ascended, as R.C. Lewontin describes it, to the state of an unchallenged orthodoxy, and there it stayed long beyond all reason, unmoved by all contrary experimental evidence. It was not until the 1970s with the intervention of cybernetics and actually an exchange between cybernetics and embryology that the, rest of the, the role of the rest of the cell was critically assessed. Despite the fact that evidence for um, cytoplasmic or maternal effects, evidence for roles played by the rest of the cell had been there since the 1930s. Like the uncorroborating test results and the protests from the workshop floors of aeronautical construction, these had been shot down by the metaphoric <coughs> arsenal of gene action. The primacy of the gene, not unlike the primacy of metal, was deemed obvious. Genes must direct everything, just as aircrafts must be metal. Only they ensured an error-free reality. But this rhetorical house of Schrodinger's, built with what Derrida called the logic of contamination and the contamination of logic, hit a fault line deep within its architecture. As we now know, it was to be undone by difference in feedback. But this, what is kind of curious is this fault line Schrodinger had himself unwittingly installed when he introduced the term code and code script that we've just seen. In order to account for the scalar paradox, how could so little organize so much? How could so little material organize so much material, the designing um, and so it was precisely when he tried, to, in a sense, to deny his architect a material footprint and he introduced the term code and code script that he actually introduced exactly what was to undo the kind of executive authority of his architect. Schrodinger's chromosome, being almost pure form, is somehow decay proof outside of and not subject to the second law. And the architect with his plan helped to deliver and institute this diplomatic immunity from entropic existence. Only the architect gene has, in Schrodinger's words, quote, the astonishing gift of concentrating a stream of order on itself and thus escaping the decay into a atomic chaos of drinking orderliness. So as architects, we drink orderliness. This architect almost does not need precision but repels error in its powerful attraction of order as it, quote, maintains itself by sucking orderliness from its environment. So if you read what is life, the kind of the linguistic tropes, sucking, drinking, feeding, they're really hard at work. Food, it seems, is both literal and metaphoric, both literally and metaphorically, is at the heart of the matter. We eat ourselves back into order, stripping our plates not simply of calories, but of organization too, of negative entropy too. The kitchens of life must be busy. So in the same few years that the splitting of genetics from developmental biology, i.e. Uh, genotype from phenotype, was kind of opening the power vacuum which allowed Schrodinger to kind of erect his immaterial architecture of scalar inversion. Um, but in an altogether different era, Edwin Lutyens was working on two houses. One was three quarters of a mile wide, as it shows in the sketch, and the other was four feet wide. Both, like Schrodinger's enterprise, consisted of vast projects of unparalleled imperial control. Both were also doomed ventures. The Viceroy's Palace, within its 80-mile-wide site of Imperial Delhi, was the last desperate attempt to control the erratic, sprawling India and the soon-to-collapse colonial empire. It was to be, quoting Birdwood, like Rome, built for an eternity, so thus invoking all the anti-entropic properties of antiquity. Or, as Daniel Burnham reminded Lowe's from his deathbed to remember, a logical diagram once recorded will never die. Two diagrams of Lutyens are key here. The first is called 
comparing the Viceroy's house with the Palace of Versailles and the Houses of Parliament in Westminster, so it kind of speaks for itself, making it quite plain that this house is an engine of order and its execution. And the second, Imperial Delhi Viceroy's lower basement, demonstrates how this ordering is to resist entropy. Behind its thick basement walls, the Viceroy's house is a kind of veritable arsenal of kitchens, food stores, cellars, wood for fire for food, ice for refrigeration for food. This is a machine for converting biomass into the smooth running of an empire. And I don't know if you can read it, but it variously lists ice store, sugar, meat, dairy, bakery, kitchen coal, ice making, pastry, confectionery, lots of sugar, vegetable larder, etc., etc. The scurrying footfalls of Maxwell's demons echo in this vast network of kitchens and stores, organizing the meeting of food with heat and the meeting of food with ice. The food this basement was to produce would be used in battle against the accelerated entropy of India, as its dinners governed and its teas and tiffins negotiated and its luncheons squashed all defense. The split of early modern genetics from embryology genotype from phenotype, that is, had split many other properties normally pertinent to architecture, form from matter, instruction from materialization, linear production from more complex modes of production, the singular author from the laboring masses. I mean, note Schrodinger's gene is kind of crucially solitary, unlike Maxwell's um, universe reversing kind of army of demon subclasses for obvious reasons, but both installed power in the miniature, and in a sense both um, took the idea of the omnipresent without and converted it into the kind of omnipresent within, the tiny thing inside that can also see everything. Under the auspices of this divided state, the architect was to endow the unwitting molecule with two more properties peculiar to the architect. Schrodinger's probe strip brought into the existence the idea that to understand life, one needed to imagine it as a code that is then able to decode itself, and thus combine two potentially conflicted metaphors. For the architect, as both law and the interpretation of the law, this posed no problem whatsoever. Nor, and this is the second thing, did the force of a temporal vector driving linear execution from code into material organization, ensuring zero feedback from said material. So thus endowed, this extraordinary minimal schema extinguished any distinction between organism and instruction for the generation of the organism. All external, spatial, temporal, material parameters that that must encompass were excluded. Code script meant the organism is its description. Indeed, the organism is eclipsed by its own description as all power is to the code. Lutyens, like Schrodinger, was also strangely drawn to the miniature with its promise of higher definition and lower entropy. Whilst Lutyens was building the Viceroy's palace, he was also designing the Queen Mary's Dolls House, central exhibit to the British Empire exhibition in 1924 that was seen by an unbelievable 1.5 million visitors. And unlike and similar to Imperial Delhi, also built to secure order within an arena of trade and resource. Tiny House, however, did have a fully functioning Otis elevator, which Delhi did not get, but it also had Chateau Lafitte in the cellar, hot running water in the taps, soap that cleaned, marmalade that spread, working motor cars in the garage, a real library with real Rudyard Kipling written in his real tiny cursive script, vinyl records that would play on a fully functioning gramophone. You get the idea. This house was nothing like the architectural models Lutyens loved so much. It's instrumental, like Schrodinger's extraordinary miniature metaphoric immaterial architecture, the doll's house that is his gene architect. It carried with itself its own decoding, its own execution too. But Cloding, uh, <laughs> Schrodinger wasn't just building metaphoric doll's houses. In Dublin, where he was given the What Is Life lectures, he was also building real ones too. A 1943 Time magazine review of his What If Life lectures wrote, what especially appeals to the Irish about Schrodinger's hobby is, is his, about Schrodinger is his hobby of making tiny doll's house furniture with textiles woven on a midget Irish loom. 
For the one-to-one -one spectator, the organizing logic of a doll's house is often much more clearly evident than that of their own. In the absence of ambition, anim well, possibly, but in the absence of animation is what I meant to see, order prevails in this miniature world. Here, Schrodinger was able to play life to weave its different patterns in this tiny loom. But what did these woven printouts mean to him before they became the blankets and rugs of his harmonious model of domesticity, somewhat more ordered than his own complicated life? Schrodinger lived in Clontarf with his wife, his mistress, and his daughter by his mistress. So it was a rather unusual household. In 1941, Desmond McManara recalls a visit to the somewhat unusual household and writes, he even showed me his tapestries. These were striking little strips woven on a small loom in the pattern of mathematical formulae, and they were strangely attractive and pinned to several walls, like a dado. By the way, that's not one of Schrodinger's textiles. That's the Human Genome Project. Jacquard with his loom and Turing with his machine is here. That Schrodinger did not simply make miniature things, their very making must itself be miniaturized is very telling. Like Lutyen's doll's house, Schrodinger's was performative too, with its loom whose pattern making reflected other coded patterns, the genetic code script, for instance, that would install everything Watson and Crick needed for their own spiraling ambitions, and ultimately for Norbert Weiner's hypothetical man to be sent down a telegraph wire. So in Peter de Normanville's 1965 film, Man and Computer, commissioned by IBM, which is the one with the optimized city I showed earlier as well, the imagery of domesticity, a kind of domestic setting with tiny people, is also used, is again used to explain how something so small, in this case the microprocessor, can organize something so big, in which case the city. So, IBM puts these tiny people inside a computer and sits them around a funny table. And the man at the head is the control unit. The chap we just saw with the glasses is the input. The lady is obviously dealing with the storage, so she's memory. The guy with the red hair is the calculator. And eventually, he will pass something to a lady with a typewriter who is the output like a dysfunctional family endlessly passing the salt back and forth. Their pedantic passing of tasks through the laborious iterative steps is not only unintentionally deeply comic, but through its kind of domestification of the apparently linear execution of order reveals a kind of hidden recursive spatiality. Only able to do one thing at a time, the miniature people in this counting machine take no shortcuts and they never make a mistake. In foundations of mathematics, in a kind of fear about the propensity of error to develop in calculation and kind of thinking about error in calculation versus error in, in counting, Wittgenstein does 25 by 25. So he stacks them 25 over 25, 5 times 5 is 25, but the 5 carry the 2, 2 times 5 is 10, so on. And then starts to kind of unravel, starts to wonder if this is maybe just some kind of anthropological ritual and this is, you know, this, there's no way to know that this is going to give the truth. So turns to the kind of childlike business of counting and draws a grid of four by five dots and counts rows by column and then counts column by rows. The answer is the same. He can count the commutative law into being. All is safe from the deceit of error. Or is it? While embryologists faced with the unrivaled ambition of Schrodinger's genes were without the metaphoric arsenal of the geneticists, they did have a kind of material arsenal of sorts, not unlike that of the bemused workshop technicians of the interwar aircraft workshops, faced with the metaphoric arsenal of metallization. As we now know, their observations of cell life throughout many phenomena that disrupted the executive centrality of gene action. All, however, were dismissed as being formless and therefore of no value, variously as white noise, random cellular movements, chance molecular events, developmental noise, and so on, i.e. all as error. 
The legacy of Schrodinger's all-controlling gene and the causal linearity it secured was such that even as late as 1992, so the Genome Project is like eight years old by that stage, it's kind of well underway, Lewontin in a review of a recent watershed of books on the Genome Project, so by geneticists that knew their stuff, was kind of forced to out the fetishization of DNA. <coughs> First, quote, First, DNA is not self-producing. Second, it makes nothing. Third, organisms are not determined by it. And as if that's not emphatic enough, he continues, not only is DNA incapable of making copies of itself, aided or unaided, it is incapable of making anything else. So, you know, one might say, finally, the gene is beginning to sound a bit like an architect. Perec answers Schrodinger's formal question, this question, what is life, with the performative answer of how, mot d'emploi, la, la vie mot d'emploi, or how, a kind of user's manual, how life works. Like a doll's house in more ways than one, this also only one room deep section of 11 Rue Simon Crubelier, the generator of both the novel structure and detail, presents the reader with an interface whose job it is, like all interfaces, to hide the Ulipian engine under the hood. A literary machine shackled to a set of algorithms, notably the night's move. Perret's epilogue closes la vie in the apartment of Serge Valen, which is somewhere up here. I think it's there, something like that. Who's lying dead on his bed with a section sketched on a canvas beside him of, quote, a block of flats which no figure would ever come to inhabit. This mise en abîme of diagrams within diagrams makes it clear that this section is no normal interface. It is an algorithm too, a program, and in Valen's apartment, its course is run, its script is complete. But the price of the error-free calculation, which those little people at the IBM dinner table guarantee, is the same looping redundancy that Perec so brilliantly parodies in his lesser known one-sentence novel, the art and craft of approaching your head of department to submit a request for a raise. Written in 1968, which incidentally is the same year that Waddington installed the term program tape in the DNA molecule for the DNA molecule, as the computer metaphor finally stepped into the shoes vacated by the architect metaphor. And no, it's kind of interesting, Waddington installing the term program. Again, these terms arrive impossibly alone. There's no hardware to read the program. There's no programmer whose desires are somehow recorded within the program. You know, despite, in a sense, all the promises of non-linearity, obviously still can't resist the ruthlessness that is such a kind of central attribute of causal linearity, still can't resist the kind of autonomous term. So, the art, a craft, or l'art, use the basic, use a kind of basic inspired flowchart, complete with, is his face spotty? A-t-il des boutons rouges here? Or, not interested in your case, so no, so you go into the waste paper basket, to write the punctuation-free, breathless iteration in extenso. The resultant text makes manifest an architecture of exquisite precision and baroque redundancy. Perec says, I have not allowed myself to, under, to utter a proposition without having retracted all those that precede it. The end result is a text of 57 pages built entirely on redundancy. The nameless underling who is subjected to the chorus of this algorithm, if yes, then, if no, then, and so on, and actually the reader is also subjected to the chorus of the algorithm as he circumperambulates, which is Belos's artful translation of Perec's Faire Retour de, the various departments, draws the reader through its looping, co looping corridors as he doggedly follows what Perec refers to as his syntactic uh, connectors, dodging grumpy secretaries and taking refuge at anonymous water fountains, always waiting for the right moment to pop the question to Mr. X. Like IBM's demon, Perec's minion is infinitely patient endlessly repeating the circular logic of the algorithm, exhaustive in his actions, but like his task, never exhausted. A task is completable, as the narrator of Man and Computer reminds us, only if the program has the word final command stop. Unlike La Vie, Perec's flowchart has no such instruction. 
and at page 57, we have to abandon him to his Sisyphean doom. Never has the recursive legacy of the Turing machine, the error eradicating one task at a time space that underpins the only apparent simultaneity of the computer's performance, been so artfully conjured than in this miniaturized solitary looping of a 1960s office plan via the corridors of anxiety. While La Vie is, is in many ways a diagram sectional disguised as a building, La is a building that is a 1960s office plan disguised as a diagram, a flowchart. As we follow this underling's miserable hopes and plan his kind of planometric vectors of anxiety, we find that like him and the eternal IBM salt passing family, we too have finally ascended to the boredom of the machine. We too have become what it has programmed tape. The looped line of repetition that La conjures is the invisible dominant space of now. It's the space behind all the extraordinary spaces we make in and with the computer. Behind the glossy renders, the ranks of optimized facade components, the exquisite 3D prints of digital fabrication, we find quite simply in the new black box of the algorithm, the bureaucratic loop. Just as Zera followed life out of the gene action pan and into the cybernetic fire, so too must it follow architecture out of the causal linearity pan and into the circulatory space of the regulated network. I want to close with the knight's 23rd move in Morrow's apartment, where we find a red pig fetus, product of a private experiment to unseat DNA and prove the contribution of cellular feedback by feeding the pig mother um, red paint for 84 days. Um, with, so the quote from Parekh is a skeleton read through of a young pig whose mother the scientist has fed for 84 days the pregnancy on food mixed with madder rose to prove experimentally the direct relationship of mother and fetus. And next to it, and I kid you not, a doll's house. Parekh's um, citation of Joyce, so in his citation, oops, in his quotation column here, Joyce, and he's, it's, it's Parekh's miniature materialization of Bloom's dream house in Ulysses, replete with clocks, encyclopedia, socks, champagne bottles, and automatic telephone receivers, which this house which, as Joyce wrote, all concurrent and consecutive ambitions coalesced. Last slide. On the left is Via Chalman's work to fix an image in memory in which she went out into the desert, chose several rocks, and then indexically transcribed their surfaces onto their cast bronze replicas in a kind of act of exquisite precision and exquisite self erasure. And on the right, an even more exquisite example of self erasure, exercise in self erasure, are the several doors that populate um, the ground floor of Wittgenstein's house. Many of these doors are double doors. And actually, if you count all the leaves of all the doors and shutters in the ground floor of Wittgenstein's house, there's 45, which means the open shut configuration is 45 factorial, a very large number of configurations for Wittgenstein's house that is a machine for thinking in. The counting machine that is every digital process promises an error-free product, what after all is error in a non-random environment. But by definition, any attempt to totally eradicate error or indeed to domesticate it and thus somehow legitimize it is missing the point. Not only will it merely become the next new thing that we don't want, but also more importantly, the very value of error is its ability to interrupt and ambush a system from within. But is counting safe? Wittgenstein asks. Yes, he answers. But only if the pieces don't change, if they don't change and we don't make some unintelligible mistake or a piece disappear or get added without our noticing it. Thank you. Before we open um, the floor up to questions, I just have one, I don't know if it's a question, I don't know if it's a useful question, but I think it's one that for me 
over the course of the talk was just kind of coming um, closer and closer to the surface. And I think what was really beautiful about the talk was, in a way, the parallel experience that you, that I kind of underwent, where you have images that collect together an unbelievable um, set of kind of technical histories. Uh -huh. And what we hear, which is in a way a waterfall of like, really beautiful language. And, and I think what it did, in a way that not very many lectures do, is really place the reader or the audience as this kind of builder. I felt like these were the technical and you were the Baroque in some sense. And I'm just, uh -huh. I, I'm trying to, what it does is it put me in the place of trying to project that forward. And that was a really interesting uh -huh. kind of experience to be. So I guess in a way I want to maybe talk about words and talk about the, the way you construct mm -hmm. the language of the storytelling, which I think was a really interesting thing to, I don't know, to put together those specific images. That's a very lovely comment. Um, there's, this is a kind of exquisite torture here because obviously this developed as lectures, this project, as seminars and lectures, which then had to become, or wanted to become, I wanted it to become a book. And now I'm obviously been going through the process of converting it back into lectures. And um, the, a lot of the structure in the writing is associative, as you said. You know, it's kind of, it's weaving, which in a way does not lend itself to lecturing. And so obviously it's kind of setting up attention with the images. Um, and then there's, suddenly I'm able to put all these movies that I couldn't put into the book back into the material. So this, this is changing the material mm. for, for, me, for me too, in a way. I'm just not really answering your question. No, but, but I think it does work really well for lectures. I mean, in a way, I kind of want now the audiobook version as well, <laughs> maybe because I'm a lazy reader. But, um, mm. but, but the experience, if you've not been aware of it, the experience, I think, is very, it operates on the spectrum. And that's, mm -hmm. that collides the words, I think, quite beautifully with with those images in a way that makes you think, um, mm -hmm. or that made me think. And, and I thought that was a kind of wonderful experience. Um, if we can maybe open it up to the, I think we have microphones rolling. <coughs> Any questions? Hi, thank you so much for your lecture. Um, I think that you've identified a really um, like permanent problem in the architectural practice, but what would you, what is your opinion on this? Do you think we are getting too precise in the way that we draw on the computer and do you, are there any solutions that you can propose? <laughs> well, I mean, the, in a sense, I can, I can, talk about this work safely here because many people here know that I ran a unit that produced ridiculously precise drawings, but I fear that if I take this work to other schools, I'll think, oh, she's a real mud pie lady, you know, she just wants these kind of lumpy things. Not, not at all. And what I, no, I have no prescription. The, there is, um, there's no prescription, there's no desire to prescribe, but there is a desire to, encourage a critical thinking about precision that's all the more urgent now, given that we have this colossal capacity for precision at our disposal, and we're just using it so ridiculously. Um, and there is also a desire to put error as a category on the architectural table and to have it kind of problematized like any other category and kind of you know, rendered active like any other category. Thank you. What can I, can I ask about yeah. that? I don't, for me, the array of images of, mm. back, sorry. The array of images, the precedence, the sampling, is so vastly disparate. I mean, how do you get from mm -hmm the hook and the monitor to the doll's house, which I had never seen before. And I mean, how do you build and that we, kind of conversation? We still can't see Schrodinger's doll's house because there's no pictures of it, but there's all these you know, references to it. But that would be amazing to see that. Yeah. But how does that, I mean, how does that really, how do you build that conversation? I mean, how do you get from 
these images to how do you make those linkages and how are you finding them? I mean, they, as a talk, it's it kind of seamlessly is woven from one to mm -hmm. the next. And but I mean, in the in the instances of constructing the knowledge of building the research, mm -hmm. are you working from one to the other, or are you working? I mean, it seems like you're throwing throwing everything out and then beginning to look at how you in a way tether together the relationships that might create in themselves a sort of redundant computation mm -hmm. in a way. Um, well, I mean, anyone who's ever done research knows that there's this kind of bizarre alchemy to it. Oh. It, it, is, it is a weird process. I didn't know that there was a doll's house next to a red pig fetus in that apartment, and I'd already started working with Parekh on this material, and so that's a kind of bizarre moment where you think of, you know, Parekh's breathing down your neck. So, I mean, there's, there's that aspect as a kind of a formal comment, but, I mean, as I said in the beginning, I really, in the, in the book, the, there was a kind of early decision to work through the subject matter by pinning the conversation to certain artifacts to Hook's Needle, literally, or to Sutherland's window, or to Galloway's DB1 that was just, you know, this stonking heavy aeroplane that would never even think about flying. Um, and to the, the doll's house as this kind of anti-entropic project in terms of the kind of relation between error and entropy. And the so in a sense, I kind of identified these artifacts, these objects, and then groped my way out from them, worked my way out from them. Um, and there's actually, there's quite a tradition of doing that in STS. So I guess that's the answer to your question. I stole the technique from the science, technology, and society. It's kind of burgeoning new discipline where people are looking at for instance, Aramis, Bruno Latour looking at Aramis, the kind of semi-private transport system in Paris didn't work, looking at the object, or looking at the bicycle that didn't work, or looking at the kind of umbrella that never took off. There is this kind of idea of instruction through the history of a piece of hardware rather than the history of the ideas behind it and actually learning from the object. And it's, you know, it's, it's an it's a, um, educational process, you know, and learns a lot. Um, I have a, does it work? I have a quick question. Um, again, probably aligning with the previous question about how can we relate to that when we think about designing differently and thinking about architecture differently. Um, probably you answered a lot of these questions in your book um, that published the drawings of the unit. In a way, what kind of reverberations that would have on thinking of that um, in how we teach architects to think. But um, I, I couldn't help but think that maybe I should ask you more directly the question, if we then go away from being um, under this spell and illusion that technological path through the computer, through the generic, genetic algorithms would somehow um, uh, fall into the category of this errorless uh, DNA-like, you, you said the architect was related to the, uh, the gene. No, and, Schrodinger uh, said that, I never Yes, uh, but uh, a lot of our students are under that kind of um, spell that they can somehow create a miraculous sequence of commands that would be coded in a perfect diagram then translated through the, the computer technology and would generate the project. I guess one thing you warned us against is um, that kind of blind belief in the project generating itself, but that then what, what would be your comment if we see through the um, dangers of that, how would then maybe, I think some of your, your talk today made me really think about between the error of the human hand and the error or perhaps the imprecise workings of the human brain, that you're somehow inviting it back into architecture and in, inviting it back in how we think about method and technique, both in how we teach and how we analyze the, the built work done today. Is, is that something that you're asking us to think about? Which thing? <laughs> the, the, yeah. the danger of the seemingly errorless digital code and algo genetic algorithm and the, also the, the forgotten promise of the imprecise hand and imprecise human brain. Yeah. 
A lovely comment, big comment. Um, in a sense, the kind of fundamental question is how, how do we best meet the precision of the computer? You know, how do we best um, engage with that precision? And the, um, it's not, it's, it's a very tricky subject matter because, you know, it's not to come across as some kind of nostalgia for the human hand, okay? It's not to come across as anti-digital fabrication, anti-the-computer, um, it's, but it is, it is to um, point out that these, none of these things are quite so straightforward, you know? The computer is a random free environment, it is a kind of error-free environment in a way, but that defends how we define error, and error always transmutes, always becomes the next new thing we don't want, so it surely is doing that now, and we will see what it is. Um, so, in a sense, in, I and mean, I'm kind of surprised to hear that your students are still, Schrodinger named the gene architect, this is kind of this ultimate, this uber architect, you know, the kind of ultimate causal linearity, executive authority model. I'm surprised that your students or any students are still kind of referring back to that model. I thought that model was kind of, you know, cybernetics killed that model and eventually it's kind of touched architecture. But I think what's, in a sense, what's interesting is that we have jumped out of the pan into the fire. And the, but the error in the pan, in the kind of causal linearity pan, is different from the error in the kind of regulated network fire. And we need to, oh, we don't need to do anything, but it would be interesting to, to kind of act more critically in respect to error and precision in, within both of those paradigms, within each of those paradigms. Um, I mean, I think that what I didn't talk about, I mean, I completely excised for tonight and for here the parts of the book that look at the practice of different artists. And in a sense, those are the parts that might answer your questions without me being, with me desperately trying not to be prescriptive, which is actually looking at error and precision relations in Via Selman's work, in Hepworth's work, in Gordon Matthew Clark's work, in Rachel Whitefield's work. And what all of them reveal a kind of quite alternative economies of precision and error. And, and architecture is remarkably uninventive about its economies of precision and error. We, have, we grossly inflate precision, we kind of use massive resources to underwrite this precision that's completely redundant and we deny any redundancy and we fetishize it. Well, isn't that weird? You know, and, and what would change in architecture if we thought about that differently? Do there any other questions? Oh, please join me in thanking Francesca Hughes for the wonderful talk tonight. Thank you very much.